Hello and welcome to Trends in Marketing with Dr. Jagdish Sheth, the award-winning Charles Kelstep Professor of Marketing at Emory University. My name is John Christensen. I am the host and moderator of this series. Today's topic is growing the core business. After decades of growth through diversification and conglomerates, more and more companies are divesting unrelated businesses and refocusing on the core mature businesses. Growing a mature business is the focus of today's presentation. Dr. Sheth will recommend several strategies for growing the core business and discuss how to diversify in a disciplined way that utilizes the company's core competencies. After the presentation, Dr. Sheth will answer questions. And now, here is Dr. Sheth. Thank you, John. Welcome to this seminar. This one has to do with growing the core business. I will start with a story about a company in Chicago, Beatrice Foods. Beatrice Foods in the early 80s decided to diversify from the traditional core business, which had companies like La Choi Chow Ming, Dan and Yogurt, and they began to diversify by buying out small and medium size, about 140 different companies. They had in their portfolio companies like Samsonite Luggage, Rusty Jones Rust Proofing Company, some computer companies, some chemical companies. They had, in fact, a huge diversification. And the view of the management at that time was that the more we diversify, the more we will reduce the risk of the company. And we will grow through some businesses and we'll generate cash flow from some other businesses and giving, therefore, to the shareholders a good shareholder value. This is the days of conglomerates. That was the way of growing business. All through the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, we went through that cycle. But today, the way companies grow the business is almost the opposite. The more you are diversified, the stock market actually punishes the company. It is called a diversification discount. And all the academic research has suggested that it adds up to about 18 to 20% shareholder value reduction the more you are a conglomerate and a holding company. We will look into this a little later on, but the notion is that there's a whole new approach to growing business. The shareholders and the financial institutional investors are now more and more putting pressure on companies to say, go back to your core business and deliver growth through the core business rather than deliver growth through diversification, especially unrelated diversification. Diversification, if you are in consumer goods to, for example, business products and services. Diversification from products to services, all the stuff, and that is being negated more and more now. So let's start the journey by looking at the first slide around here. The first slide has to do, in fact, with how do you get the shareholder value. If you look at the total shareholder value, it's called total return. It comes from two sources, dividends on the one hand, and stock appreciation on the other hand. The dividends usually come from operating cash flow, which is why measures like EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation, for example, are very, very important ones. And those are the ones that generate operating uh, cash flow from which you pay the dividends. Generally, in order to generate more and more EBITDA, we try to use a particular approach, which is called economic value added, EVA, which became a very popular topic, actually, for looking at the way one would invest into the company. The notion was very clear that does the company generate enough cash flow so that it is able to support, on the one hand, the tax you have to pay to the government, or the dividends, the non-operating cost, the dividends, for example, or also, in fact, to support cost of capital. And that's a very interesting approach. That particular approach generally makes the company focus on cost reduction. You somehow figure out operationally where you are inefficient, and you try to get more and more the bottom line as a way of growing the business. On the other side is the stock appreciation, which comes from positioning for the growth. So if you are positioning for the future where you're going to grow, that is where the top line growth is the one. So you have the bottom line through the EVA, operating cash flow, 
and you have the top line that comes in fact from positioning for the growth in the future by and large. However, the ratios are very important. In fact, in the chart, as you will see, 20% of the total return comes from the dividends, 80% comes in fact from positioning for the growth by and large. And that is a key debate going on, which is a better model. Generally, you need both of them. That's the idea. Generally, you need both of the combined, but the weight is that 80% comes from growth and 20% comes in fact from cash flow or profitability. So this is the debate that's going on, that if we can somehow manage more growth through diversification, which was the old model. So if you look at the chart, the positioning for the future by leveraging the present resources is therefore critical to the business success. Some companies have done a great job of transitioning from the old businesses to the newer businesses. My best example for this one is Monsanto Company. Monsanto Company has been very successful, maybe fourth generation of transition they have made so far. First of all, they are primarily into textile chemicals. That's how they began their journey. And when textile industry somehow began to be outsourced from America, they decided that is not the future in America. So they diversified from textile chemicals to more and more industrial chemicals. It, the division used to be called Monsanto Industrial Chemicals, or MIC. Then they found out that industrial chemicals themselves, especially bulk chemicals, are not going to be the future. They would not be able to compete very well. So they diversified into agricultural chemicals. When I was advising them, working them, I found fascinating that out of the more than four, 200 product categories, four product categories, which were most profitable out of five, all came from the agricultural division. There are brand names like Lasso, Avadex, which was for rice uh, herbicide. Uh, Lasso, in fact, was primarily for corn and soybean. And they have, of course, uh, Roundup, which was their best successful product by and large. These were all chemical technologies, very appropriate, however, for a very specialized application. And the margins were very good. Growth was enormous. So they began to focus more and more in agricultural chemicals. Then in the last 20 years, when we began to outsource agriculture, when we began to cut all the subsidies in agriculture out, especially let's say in tobacco, for example, the time had come for Monsanto to think about doing something differently. And what they decided to go into healthcare chemicals by and large or pharmaceuticals. And in this case, what they did was to acquire a company called GD Searle. They have their own internal R&D department, and Monsanto today is less and less into textile chemicals or industrial chemicals or even agricultural chemicals and more and more into pharmaceuticals, health sciences, healthcare business by and large. To me, that's a beautiful transition. Transition occurred very nicely also for one more reason, underlying they were in the same business, even though they diversified. The core competency still was primarily chemicals as opposed to, let's say, electronics, as opposed to mechanical or something else. And that is why the same scientists who can understand chemistry can continue the journey by transitioning from one application to another application. And to me, it is one of the best examples I have seen about how a company can position its future growth by leveraging its existing resources. Another company in the same category that comes in my mind is 3M company. 3M is a highly diversified company. If you analyze the different divisions they have, the number of product categories they have, probably in their catalog they must have at least 50,000 different product categories, probably more than 50 to 60 different divisions. In fact, when I worked at uh, the 3M company, I suddenly realized that 3M company is more like a banyan tree in other words, the main trunk has branches that grow out that become the roots, in fact, to start another trunk. In fact, they generally what they have done is to take any division that grows above a certain size, let's say 100 millions or more, they break it up into two divisions. Highly decentralized profit and loss, very flat organization, and a world-class company. While it is famous for its innovation drive, and 3M has invented some of the best products that we can think about, like post-it notes more recently, or scotch tape in the old days. 
But more interestingly is that as they have diversified into different applications, they have found that if they diversify away from their core competency, which is disposable chemistry, they have not done very well. For example, they went into office products like overhead projectors and did not do very well. They went into telecom products, products made for uh, uh, you know, telecommunications industry, uh, primarily for installation, maintenance, kinds of products. It turns out to be, again, they have not done very well. They actually separated out the division and then uh, created into a separate company. Underlying, again, you have a tremendous growth from a core competency. In this case, it's disposable chemistry. Generally, when I talk about this whole growth through the core business as a new approach to doing business, as what the stock market is demanding more and more on companies, people have always raised the questions, but what about General Electric? Isn't General Electric still a conglomerate? Uh, the answer is yes and no. In fact, before Jack Welch became the CEO, General Electric was into more diversified businesses following the same logic as most large American corporations from the 50s and the 60s, a very large diversified conglomerate holding company. And the last CEO before uh, Jack Welch became the CEO, Reginald Jones had one of the best strategic planning processes in place, trying to balance growth with profitability. But after he retired, Jack Welch came into uh, the senior leadership position, and guess what? Out of the 59 or 60 separate different businesses, General Electric actually has gone back to, back to its core businesses and began to more and more get growth out of their core businesses, such as, for example, GE Energy business, such as, for example, GE Aircraft uh, Engine business. They have diversified into a couple of things which are unusual for a General Electric, such as, for example, they bought NBC, a television network, and they are now into media business, such as, for example, they diversified into financial services and created one of the largest enterprises called GE Capital. So the answer is yes, that they are more diversified than generally what we would see, but at the same time, they are a lot more focused today than ever before, such as into medical products, for example, energy business, aircraft uh, engine and maintenance business, as well as, in fact, financial services business by and large. So generally, the notion is that you must actually uh, make sure that you are getting back to the core business somehow, which is the way to do business and grow the core business. So here is a model that I'm going to show you. Most companies typically have two objectives to deliver shareholder value. One is the growth, other one is the profitability or cash flow. I like more cash flow than profitability as a measure because profitability, unfortunately, could be more from a tax viewpoint, more from a managerial accounting viewpoint, or more from some other viewpoint. There is so much of you can do with numbers. What I like ultimately is the cash. Cash is the king, essentially, kind of a notion. So I use cash flow as one dimension and growth as another dimension. Now, there are businesses in a portfolio. The old model used to be a creating a portfolio, so you deliver growth from some businesses and cash from some other businesses. So in this particular chart, as you will see, growth is very good, but cash flow is poor, which is the upper left quadrant. That turns out to be usually startup businesses. Startup businesses are ones where it's a new business that you are growing, maybe in a new industry altogether, but at the same time, it needs more and more investment of cash or capital by and large, both fixed capital as well as working capital, so it is not going to have a cash flow. But as the business grows, hopefully, it moves to the right side. So now growth is continuing and cash flow is also positive. Then it comes down where cash flow is very positive. You are not investing anymore. You are actually harvesting, but the growth is not there. The industry is mature. Your, your particular division or a strategic business unit is mature over there. And that box, upper right box, is generally what people call cash. Uh, uh, cash cows. I have labeled as cash pigs. I come from India. Cows are always sacred to me, please. So no cow jokes, okay? So I call it cash pigs. And the notion is that in there are upper left box ultimately where it says business is on a permanent decline as we can see right now, for example, the typical camera business at Kodak. 
the digital technology has come in. More and more people are buying digital uh, uh, you know, um, cameras and photography, and therefore the role of the film business has to decline, very similar to what happened in Kodak, like eight millim millimeter as a technology for making movies. Eight millimeter for a home video is gone pretty much by now. In fact, more and more people have bought typical video cameras, and therefore eight millimeter has become, rather than a core way of doing things, more a peripheral specialty way of doing things. So you could have businesses where cash flow is also getting less and less and growth is negative by and large, and that generally is called a dog business. These words were created by BCG at one time, Boston Consulting Group, but I'm using the words, but the, my dimensions are not the same, please. There's a lot of confusion between this chart and the BCG chart. BCG talked about industry growth. I talk about company growth, it has nothing with the industry growth. You as a company may be growing in a stagnant industry. BCG also talked about market share. Market share was a surrogate for getting more profitability. I don't know whether market share delivers profitability or not. In fact, if you look at the airline business today, it does not. All the three major carriers, surprisingly, in fact, are not profitable, even though they have a very large market share. So we will talk about that later on. My dimension is cash flow. So it has nothing to do with the industry, nothing to do with the company position within that industry. Mine is typical company's own financials that it has to report in 10K or 10Q forms every quarter by and large, and is held accountable to shareholders on an annual shareholder meeting which are the two criteria on which a company is always evaluated. These are company criteria. How fast are you growing, not how industry is growing, and what is your cash flow position? So while I've used the words very similar one, especially words like cash cow or dog, the chart is totally different. So I just want to make sure that you don't confuse this with the BCG chart by and large. This old model used to be that you create a portfolio. <clears throat> you will take your cash out of mature businesses, the cash pig businesses, and divert those resources into the upper left box, new ventures where you will invest, new technologies where you will invest, new markets, especially foreign countries that you will you know, be the leader, the first mover advantage, etc. And this used to be the model, and the more you showed you could do this very well, the more the shareholders rewarded you especially in the 60s, 70s, and all the way to the maybe early 80s by and large. This was the model that companies like Beatrice Foods used it. This was the model in Europe across all of the major industrial houses, whether it's the Philips Group in uh, Eindhoven, Netherlands, whether it is the Shell Oil Company, the Shell Group in Netherlands, Olivetti Group in Italy, or in fact, uh, Fiat Group in Italy. And there are many more, more examples like that. Uh, Axel Janssen Group in Sweden, for example, the Krupp Group in Germany, just goes on and on. The Thompson Group in France, I can go on all the examples, by and large. This model is under disrepute now. And the reason why it is under disrepute is very interesting to watch. So here is a chart that I will show you. This model is not working maybe for one main reason, namely that all of a sudden, when there is a market that is stagnant, stock market, and the stock prices, the stock market generally is not moving up. And the first time we saw the stagnation of the stock market was in the late 70s. After the energy crisis, we had an economic phenomenon never seen there before, where we had an inflation and stagnation at the same time. A new phrase was coined called stagflation. The prices in the stock markets were undervalued enormously. So you have a company that is trading in the marketplace whose market capitalization or market cap is very low, but it has world-class businesses which are generating enormous cash flow. Its book value may be more than its market value. Think about that. And also, in fact, it has phantom assets, hidden assets, not reported in the balance sheet, such as the brand names, which have a very, very good strategic asset value. What happens then? Since the public is not investing in these companies because the stock market is out of favor, people are either putting their money into gold or somehow saving money into banks, for example. The idea is very simple. If I am the wealthy individual 
And if I have the private equity as opposed to public equity, I can become the hostile takeover of this company. And my job is very simple. I can get more returns by breaking up the company into pieces, selling each piece separately, and I will have more return than the stock market will deliver. So they led to creation of uh, individuals like Carl Icahn, you might remember that, T. Boone Pickens, Sir Goldsmith from England, as well as, in fact, the most famous one of them, takeover person, has been Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett actually began to find highly undervalued companies and began to invest in those companies and get more value out of those companies by sitting on the board as a major investor. And the best example that we find around here is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, under the same CEO, Roberto Gozieta, had actually diversified, thinking that the cola business is not the future of the company. They had done strategic planning on their own, and they diversified into water, which makes a lot of sense, into wine business, that makes a lot of sense, but also into Columbia Pictures, which did not make sense to the analyst or to the investors by and large. The stock market was not blessing the company. Coca-Cola market cap was actually stagnant or declining. It was a highly undervalued stock. Warren Buffett invested into that company, and the rest is history. From less than $4 billion in value, working with the same CEO, divesting all of the unrelated businesses, going back into the core business, which is uh, basically soda or carbonated beverages, soft drinks by and large, but growing the software business on a global basis now, going into countries like China, going into countries like Mexico more aggressively. If the growth does not come in America, the world still needs Coca-Cola. It is the best brand in the world. That was the idea, and it did work for them very, very well. The market cap went from less than $4 billion to $104 billion in about 10 years. Outstanding shareholder value was created by going back to the core business, essentially. In fact, many people used to ask Roberto Gozieta, isn't there a limit to consumption of Coca-Cola? And his answer was very simple. Think about that one. Today in China, they only consume three bottles or cans per capita per year. If we can make them drink 100 bottles or cans per capita per year in China, all of the 21st century will deliver more growth to Coca-Cola than the last century in which Coca-Cola actually uh, began its journey. Fascinating, right? That's just one market. They had a similar view about India as a market. And people would say, but you know, China is different. The substitute products are hot tea, green tea. India is different. The substitute products are water. They have different traditions. Why would they switch to Coca-Cola? And the answer was very simple. Look at Mexico. The highest per capita consumption in the world of Coca-Cola is in Mexico. It averages about 400 bottles per year uh, per person. Mind-boggling. It is bigger than even in American share. In fact, in America, Coca-Cola per capita consumption may be about 300 bottles and stagnating or declining with the aging of the population so it is almost, in fact, about uh, growing enormously in emerging markets by and large. Yet it does have a higher share in the southeast five regions or four states, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, etc., where it may be as high as 600, 650 bottles per capita. But think about going back to the core business and growing the core business. Excellent example. A second reason why the portfolio model is given up to more focusing back on core business has to do with competition. If you're into 50 businesses, there is no way you can fight 50 different fronts of competition. You have to choose your battles right. Your resources get too much diluted. And the resources are not money, as we think, as much as management bandwidth. And the idea, therefore, is that the old model of having subsidiaries after subsidiaries, having a holding company, which is what is traded in the public stock exchanges. Subsidiaries do their own things, and we aggregate all of the financials into a holding company. Just is not workable because competition is very different. In fact, this change is happening for companies like regulated utilities, 
At one time, if you remember, both the baby bells that were created in 1984 decided they have no more future growth in their core business, which is local exchange. Long distance, which was a growth engine, was with AT&T. The emerging data networks were all, in fact, with long distance carriers. They were not allowed to be in manufacturing. They were not allowed to be in information services. They were not allowed to be in long distance. Their core business looked like a stagnant business. So they decided to diversify into so many other activities. And guess what happened? Most of them, they failed and collapsed. They're all back into the core business now. Whether it is US West, which is no longer in existence, it is a part of a, another company, in fact, a Quest, <clears throat> or whether it is Bell South in Atlanta, whether, in fact, it is Verizon, as we call it, which is an aggregation merger acquisitions of companies like Bell Atlantic and 9X, two baby bells, and then buying out GTE, or SBC, which is a merger of about three major companies, and that is SBC itself, Ameritech, another baby bell, and then Pacific Bell, all three baby bells put together. Very fascinating to watch that they all are finding that they cannot compete into other areas. They are very strong in the areas which is their core business. In fact, all baby bells to me and most regulated utilities, including electric utilities, for example, look to me like a, a very large tiger in a pond. Very powerful in the pond, outside the pond, totally helpless. That's clearly what we have seen. I've seen the same thing in Philips. In Netherlands, Philips was a highly diversified company. They were into practically everything. World-class enterprise, one of the best R&D companies in the world. Uh, they were almost the inventors of many new things. While we think of Sony as the inventor of many technologies, Philips is in the same category or even better, my view. Fascinating, here is a company that had diversified into so many different things, thinking they are primarily in consumer goods, although they had a lot of industrial products, they had semiconductors, began to decide that after the 70s and early 80s, they need to go back to their core business because they could not sustain separate competition. For example, in consumer electronics, they could not sustain competition against Japan at one time and Korea later on. In appliances businesses, again, they were very large appliance makers. They decided that is not the future because appliance business was very competitive. And now the foreign companies were coming, in fact, to Europe, which was their strength. Around here in America, we already had General Electric in appliance. We had, in fact, a Whirlpool, which is a very large company. And we had companies like White Consolidated. And they could not make any entry successfully into America. In Europe, they had a competition like Electrolux, Bosch, et cetera, et cetera. They decided this business is just a very tough business and began to focus back into their core competency, which turns out to be semiconductors. More and more, they are into semiconductor business than any other business. Today, I see the same trend in India, which is an emerging market after the liberalization of the economy. Competition is coming in. And again, very large industrial houses like European companies which had a domestic orientation, but as many as 30, 40 different businesses, that model is giving way to focusing on core businesses. For example, there is a very large industrial company called the Birla Group, B-I-R-L-A, Aditya Birla Group, A-B-G. They were into so many businesses, they've decided they will go back to their core businesses, maybe four, five, six businesses, such as traditional businesses like cement, fiber, aluminum, etc. Tata, T-A-T-A, -A, very large company again, highly diversified into maybe 30, 40 businesses. They began with the steel company, then they went into automotive, locomotives, consumer products. They went into every place because that was the model that was highly rewarded by the stock market. But today, again, they have to reduce the number of different businesses they are in and focus on a few core businesses which is the new model that's coming in. So this is the second reason why, in fact, competition is so different from each one of those businesses. You can sustain, as I mentioned, 50 fronts of competition, and therefore you have to choose your battles carefully where you are very likely to win the battle kind of a notion. A third reason why this conglomerate model is out of favor now has to do with cultural clashes among businesses. When you have a very mature business, it's a legacy business. And when you have a new high growth business, 
the two have very different attitudes, very different cultures. I've seen this thing. For example, you take a typical telco business, and now you talk about the internet business. We call them the bellheads and the netheads. The two just don't see eye to eye. Always conflicts at companies like Lucent, Nortel, etc., etc. Same thing happens when you have a analog technology experts and you are now into digital technology. One is basically legacy, you want to give up on them, they are the dinosaurs kind of a notion, even though they are producing enormous cash flow. Other one are the, the sort of blue-eyed next generation of uh, hotshot products and companies by and large. You have this huge arrogance on one side and tremendous amount of uh, lack of self-confidence on the other side. By the way, it happens even within a company. If you are into the mainframe computing business, for example, is a mainframe really a legacy business? Is it all gone, such as an IBM series? And are you really into more, the more traditional PC business? These are the debates that go on in the company all the time. And problem is that these debates paralyze the company. Companies are unable to make decisions as to what they want to be or what they should be. And this, again, the management bandwidth it gets dissipated into energies where it is non-productive by and large, which is another reason why many companies decided it's better to get out of this conglomerate model, focus on the core businesses, and drive those businesses from a growth viewpoint by and large. One more area why the conglomerate model is giving way is failure of startup businesses. And the best example I find is Exxon, uh, before it became Exxon Mobil recently. Exxon Oil, right after the energy crisis, for some reason decided oil industry is not the future. As you know, oil companies are one of the largest users of computing technology. It's a process industry, and most of the IBM mainframes would be heavily, heavily deployed. They spend billions of dollars annually in operating maintenance cost as well as in capital costs. So the idea was very simple. Why not create a separate, in fact, uh, a Exxon Information Systems Group? It is a hot new growing area anyhow. Diversify the money into that category. And the way to start that one, because you have some uh, IT capability, you may have a chief information officer, and he's probably running an internal uh, cost center of maybe billion, billion and a half, something like that. Why not use that as an anchor bring in all the new businesses, and actually they ended up buying almost 40 to 45 different businesses, paid premium prices, all in the IT area, has nothing to do with the oil business, took the oil money as a cash pig and divert into this IT area, and guess what? Collapsed completely. They lost all of the premium they paid to the startup companies. Entrepreneurs cannot mix very well with corporate bureaucrats, essentially. Most of the entrepreneurs felt like they're being trapped into a process and a bureaucracy, so they began to leave. Very fascinating. And at the end, Exxon closed the whole division by taking more than a billion dollar losses. Same thing happened, in fact, with US West, which I mentioned earlier. I was working at that time in telephone industry with all of the baby bells. I had a center for the telephone industry. And U.S. West decided to go into areas like training because all telephone companies do enormous internal training. They went into financial services because they had a huge cash flow coming in. Sounded like a very good diversification because, remember, they were trapped into doing only local exchange, not allowed to go into long distance manufacturing or internet services, what we call today internet. It's called just information services in those days. So they decided they will get away from the telephone business. And guess what? You have this five, $10 million business into training, and senior most management is paying attention so much to that business and not paying enough attention to their core business, which is a multi-billion dollar business. Totally out of line in terms of management attention versus the financial realities. Fortunately or unfortunately for US West, most of those businesses did not make money. They also gave up on the diversification and went back into their core business by and large. So that's one more area is the failure of startup businesses generally is enormous. And because of that, companies are simply saying this diversification model does not work anymore. Last area has to do with lack of resource synergy. 
quite often we believe, in fact, that by diversifying into businesses, we might have resource synergy, financial resources, operational resources, real estate resources, definitely management resources kind of a thinking. And this is a very typical thinking which makes sense on, at the first blush. Many consultant companies will come in and recommend that. Looks logical. So you diversify. So I found, for example, two examples where this diversification almost actually destroyed the companies. Both looked very good. Uh, the most famous one, obviously, is AOL Time Warner. Excellent journey. You had a time company, which was a positive cash flow print business. Magazines like Time, Sports Illustrated doing very, very well. But there's no future into the sort of a print media, by and large. That was the thinking. Why not diversify into, for example, an entertainment business? So they bought out the Warner Studios and Warner Films, all of the archival films, which have a huge valuation. So it became Time Warner. Then they decided, OK, let's diversify further. So they bought CNN here in Atlanta. And finally, they bought AOL. And guess what? They collapsed in the process completely. Now, if you think this is something new, it's not. If you go back to the history of television industry in America, same thing happened. Again, in the 60s, 70s phenomenon, diversification is the way, in fact, to grow the business. So you had CBS, the top, top television network, rather than staying as a television network, began to say, we are not in the television business, but we are into recreation and entertainment business, and diversified into publishing, into conference centers, into resorts, and collapsed. It was bought out by the Tisch family, and Tisch family revitalized, sold everything out. Remember the takeover model that I talked about earlier, and sold it eventually to what is now called the Viacom. Because CBS did it, guess what? There's a herd mentality in every industry. So NBC follows the same model, collapses the same way. And guess what? It was bought out by General Electric. Great asset. General Electric got out of the whole thing. And same thing happened to ABC. And ABC also collapsed in diversification and was bought out by a private equity investment firm, uh, Capital, I think, uh, Capital Cities or something like that, which eventually, in fact, uh, restructured the company and sold it now, in fact, to, in this case, Disney, uh, Walt Disney, a uh, you know, corporation by and large, interestingly. So diversification has not worked very well. We pride on the synergy. Synergy does not come. I'll show you later on where the synergy does come. There are areas where synergy is there, but this is not the good examples. The next area that I can talk about, lack of synergy, which looks so compellingly right, was AT&T. AT&T decided, especially after they brought an outside CEO, that long distance will collapse. It's a commodity business. Margins will collapse. Growth won't be as, as much as it used to be. Fortunately for AT&T, after the divesture of the baby bells, the local exchange business, prices still for long distance were so high as the prices collapsed, all the decade of the 80s, actually, in fact, long distance business grew with declining prices, and therefore the revenues were growing moderately. But in the decade of the 90s, that growth just was not there anymore. Prices were still declining further on, and you had the internet coming on board. More and more, data traffic was growing rather than a voice traffic. Computer to computer communication, in other words, or people to machine communication, which is all data communication. So AT&T decided to diversify, thinking that they have 60 million residential customers in the database. So they decided to diversify by buying cable companies, knowing very well that cable is an unregulated business, but a monopoly at the same time, an enviable position, unregulated monopoly, which means they can charge the price because in any one geography, there's only one cable company. Just like there's only one water company, there's only one electric company, but they're all regulated. Here is an unregulated monopoly. What a wonderful opportunity. And they began to buy out all of the cable companies, such as Media One, Comcast, etc., and created a very large cable, thinking that now they will have two pipelines going into the house, the telephone line on the one hand, as well as, in fact, the cable line. Made perfect sense. They also said, of course, the future growth lies with broadband or 
ISP business as we call it, internet service provider. So they began to diversify into that. They bought some companies actually to grow the business. And guess what? The debt they incurred to buy the cable companies collapsed the company essentially. Company decided eventually to divest the cable business, get out of many of these diversifications that looked very reasonable because they're a common denominator, not technology, but the customer base. And unfortunately, it did not work for them. So often the synergies are not there as we think, and that's usually a problem that we need to worry about, right? So where do we go for growth? I've given a long introduction to this one because it is so important to understand that the traditional model of diversification, conglomerates, holding company is not the future. At least not for the next, has not been the case for the 90s, and I don't see the case for the decade of, you know, this first decade of the 21st century at least. Mm -hmm.